respect to chairpersons, uh, senior sitting in the audience, and uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm a pediatric neurologist by profession. I mainly work in the private sector, but I'm also attached to the Institute of Child Health, which is one of the main uh, pediatric hospitals uh, in the, not government, I would say, but in the uh, so-called semi-government sectors. Um, I'm going to talk on a certain aspect on, uh, of cerebral palsy. What uh, Dr. Mitro was, Mr. Mitro was asking me is to answer a question. The question is, can repetitive neuroimaging, with particular emphasis on MRI, help in the management of cerebral palsy? And this is the question I'm going to try and answer. My previous speakers have already told you, but I would like to again highlight that cerebral palsy is an umbrella term that defines a group of very importantly non-progressive disorders. Just because it means non-progressive, that doesn't mean that the child or the adolescent is not going to change. A child with cerebral palsy may be walking at some point, but at some other point may not be walking. Does that mean it is progressed? Well, the disease hasn't progressed, but the circumstances have progressed. And the main condition of this syndrome is of motor impairment meaning your motor activity is hampered in certain way. Why is this due to lesions or anomalies of the brain arising in the early stages of development? So a person who has a brain trauma infection after the age of four or five or 10 is not a child or a person who has cerebral palsy. For cerebral palsy diagnosis, the damage the trauma, the cause needs to be done before the age of four years. The incidence, as has been mentioned, it's rising, it's dif uh, different studies state differently, but one of the studies I read was saying about 1.5 to 2.5% per 1,000 live births. The functional description of cerebral palsy therefore says it's a non-progressive disorder caused by a lesion or defect of the brain occurring prior to birth, that's antenatal, during birth, that's natal, or during the first four years of life, that's postnatal. And this damage is permanent in the physical condition. That affects the movement. So basically, cerebral palsy is a static motor encephalopathy, if you want to describe it in three words. Now, when we talk about children with cerebral palsy, we need to find out what the etiology is. And for that, we need to go back right from the antenatal history, mother's pregnancy, what were the birth events, how did the child fare after birth, first month of life, first year of life, and so on. And in this history taking, we often find the common causes, prematurity, twin delivery, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, torch infections, neonatal meningitis, meningitis or encephalitis later on in life, before the age of four years, all of these can be etiological factors of cerebral palsy. So we need to try and find out. If we find out the cause, we are happy. Okay, so this is the cause, therefore the child has cerebral palsy. But we also need to exclude other plausible explanations. For example, a child who has a malformation of the brain, the brain is not formed in the proper way. That can also give rise to cerebral palsy. If the child has had a congenital infection, that can also give rise to cerebral palsy. And here I want to bring to your notice certain things like inborn errors of metabolism. Now certain inborn errors of metabolism can give rise to manifestations in early life that is like cerebral palsy. But because these are progressive disorders, they are not static. An uh, inborn error of metabolism will suddenly not stop. It will carry on going. That metabolic error will happen even when you are 10, even when you are 20. So that category is not classified as cerebral palsy. So therefore, we have a differential diagnosis.
In early infancy, when all the children are in the hypotonic phase, then you have to keep in mind whether this floppy child is a cerebral palsy or whether this can be due to a neuromuscular condition like a myopathy. So this is a differential diagnosis we have to think about and sometimes we have to look at all the aspects of the child before we come to a diagnosis. Similarly, a lot of children with learning difficulties, developmental delay, they also have hypotonia and again may be thought about and we have seen pediatricians writing a label of cerebral palsy when that is not actually the case. We then have something called cerebral palsy mimics. So other things that have give rise to increased tone. One of the cardinal features of cerebral palsy is spasticity. Spastic CP is the commonest type of CP we see. So we have other conditions of the brain which are not cerebral palsy, but you see spasticity. And these are the neurodegenerative conditions. These may have an onset earlier in infancy, and some examples as are written, Tay-Sachs disease, Crabbe's disease, metachromatic leukodystrophy, all of these can mimic cerebral palsy in the early phases. And that is why we need to differentiate. Is this a static or a progressive disorder? All of these conditions are progressive. Even a condition called dopa-responsive dystonia, which has a treatment where the child may be 90% better after giving dopamine as a treatment, and certain organic acidurias like glutaric aciduria, again, they have dystonia, they have increased tone, and they may look like cerebral palsy of the dystonic type. So again, we have to make a difference about what the problem is. So the bottom line is, is it progressive? If it is progressive, then it is not likely to be cerebral palsy, but certain other things. And for this, we need to make other investigations, including neuroimaging, including other investigations like metabolic test, genetic test, and so on. As was mentioned before, clinical radiological correlation is important. We know the site of brain injury can be from cortical right down to the brain stem. These are different parts of the brain. And depending on what you see, like periventricular leukomalacia, you can have a type of spas cerebral palsy, the spastic diplegia. If you have a stroke, you have a hemiplegia, and you can see one half of the hemisphere that has an infarct. If you have multifocal encephalomalacia, you're likely to get a quadriplegic picture. So if I deal with a child who has a particular type of cerebral palsy, I'm expecting certain changes in the brain. And if the two and two come together, I'm happy with the diagnosis. So this question, first of all, was asked a long time ago, 2004, by the American Academy of Cerebral Palsy. What was the question? Very simple. Should neuroimaging be routinely obtained in children with CP? And this is the answer. The evidence was that a lot of neonates required frequent neuroimaging when there was a history of complications during pregnancy, labor, and delivery, as has been told by my previous speaker, or if they are born prematurely, or if there are neurological symptoms or findings on the neonatal examination. And what was found from a data of nearly 1,500 children showed that if you do a CT or MRI, you are likely to get an abnormality in 77% if you've done a CT and a higher 89% if you've done an MRI. And these are from different studies of class one, class two, and class three. So if you take the CT scan, from a data of 782 children who had cerebral palsy and had a CT scan, we found that there was a problem in 77% of these children. And some of these classes were, some of these studies were better, the class one studies, and some not so good. And these are the reference of the studies that I'm mentioning, right from uh, late 80s to through the 90s. So here what we are trying to say is that if you see a CT scan, for example here, 
a thalamic calcification with a child who has had a history of HIE or birth asphyxia, you're quite happy. With one CT scan, you do not need to proceed. You're happy with the diagnosis. So if I see this child later on, or this is a recent child I saw, again a CT scan, you can see how heavily damaged the brain has been. Encephalomalacia, all these black type parts of the brain you're seeing are actually supposed to be white. These have all been liquidated and become something close to water. So again, if this child comes to me with a history of HIE and I see this CT scan, I don't need to do a second CT scan on him. I'm quite happy with two plus two makes four. Same thing with MRI. In, a, in this study involving so many children, they found that 89% of children who had CP, we could find out a cause. And in some of the studies, actually 100% 100% of the children that were subjected to an MRI, they found a cause for the cerebral palsy. And these are some book pictures of different types of lesions, like periventricular leukomalacia, like liquefaction of the brain, like infarcts that are happening due to hypoxia, ischemia. If you see this picture with the right history, you are happy with the MRI. You do not need to repeat it. Dr. Thibor was talking about diffusion-weighted imaging that is very important in the early part. So again, in this diffusion-weighted images, if you have restricted diffusion early or in the basal ganglion or in the occipital cortex, you know that this child has suffered from HIE. And therefore, you put two and two together, and if that child develops spasticity or other signs of cerebral palsy later on in life, you are happy with this MRI, you do not need to repeat. Why is this point so important? Because each of these patients who are subjected to an extra procedure, especially under an anesthetic, have a higher risk of the comorbidity from that procedure. That is why it is so important. So these are some of my own patients. You can see periventricular leukomalacia. You can see a lot of cerebral atrophy. And here you can see very, very big parts of the brain that have been damaged. So all these pictures fitting into the child's clinical picture, I'm satisfied that I know the cause of cerebral palsy. I don't need to investigate this child any further. So from those two studies, the conclusions were that both CT and MRI are very important aspects for a diagnosis. MRI is more likely to be abnormal compared to CT. And of course, you know that a CT scan subjects the child to a lot of radiation exposure, which an MRI scan doesn't. And an etiology of cerebral palsy can be determined in many patients based on the results of neuroimaging in combination with the clinical history. So this, I'm hopefully, I've proved the point to you. So the recommendations were, again, the same things. We need to do imaging, and wherever MRI is available, it is preferred over CT scan, and this is all the evidence. So then we come to the point of, do we need to repeat it? Now, this is my personal practice. I've not taken this from any book. This is what I follow. In my practice, there is no rule of routinely doing a repeat MRI. For example, a child with cerebral palsy at 10 years, Oh, MRI hoy chilo? No, Dr. Babu, ak bochor boy se hoy chilo. Oh, ak bochor? No bochor aage. Aita kurenin? We don't believe in that. We will go back to the MRI of that one-year-old child, and if we are happy with the two plus two makes four, we will not subject that child to an further MRI because we have found the cause and it's fitting into the history. But it's not that simple. Sometimes, when we are dealing with patients of cerebral palsy, we do MRIs, but we do it with a particular purpose. The first thing is, if a child has new clinical symptoms and signs in central nervous system examination. For example, a child who has cerebral palsy, we know they have motor problems. They can also have swallowing problems. 
but you have this seven-year-old boy with cerebral palsy who so far was managing to have his food reasonably okay. Maybe his feeding time was more, 30 minutes, 45 minutes. But suddenly, over a few months, you find that he has having increasing dysphagia. So much so that at a point, he's unable to literally take the minimum food that is required of him. This is a new symptom. And in that case, I need to think about whether anything else has happened to the brain stem or the brain that is leading to this new symptom or sign. And in that case, of course, I will think about doing an MRI. I was talking to you about this suspected CP mimics, all the neurometabolic conditions. Now, in a lot of these metabolic conditions, if we do an MRI, it gives us certain clues that this is likely to be a neurometabolic condition. So in a child who has been labeled a CP, but previously the MRI was normal, and I'm seeing a progress in his disease, and this child hasn't had a recent MRI, I will think about doing a repeat MRI when I'm thinking about a differential diagnosis, something that is looking like a CP, but there is progress in the disease. These CP mimics sometimes need a re-evaluation and redoing the MRI. And the last point is, if you've had a previous MRI of poor quality. Now, the quality of MRIs are, is getting better and better. Most of us in Kolkata deal with 1.5 Tesla imaging. In some centers, there are three Tesla imaging. But 10 years ago, there were a lot of places with 0.2 Tesla imaging. Even in the districts, there are MRI units with 0.2 and 0.5 Tesla imaging. And in these cases, if you have a child with cerebral palsy, clinically, and the report of the MRI is normal, or it looks like a normal MRI to you, then I would reconsider doing another MRI to see whether actually by improving the quality of the MRI, we can find those lesions that I showed you earlier, periventricular leukomalacia, and so on. And therefore, try and put the solution to the cases. So in summary, I want to say that it's very important that these children are evaluated. You don't need to routinely do MRIs, repeat them, because each of these procedures have a risk but in certain cases, under specialist cares, which are these, you may think about doing the MRIs again. And just to illustrate the example, this is an MRI for, from a cerebral palsy patient. This is a lot of atrophy. But here you have a child with white matter disease. Here there's atrophy, but there's a basic problem in the white matter. So this child has a leukodystrophy, which is very, very different from a cerebral palsy. Thank you, and any questions?